my doubts behind I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you Jesus I'm reaching I'm reaching my hand to God Believing Believing there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for
Now, let's carry on exploring the kingdom lifestyle. There are six things that I would like to touch on regarding a kingdom lifestyle as we continue. Point number one, we belong together. We belong together. There's this little phrase in verse 44 that says, now all who believed were together. Would you say the word together? You could just glance over that and think, well, they were together. They were in one place. This refers more than being in one place. I believe that this refers to being in a spirit of unity. I believe that they were a church having one heart and having one mind. And I believe churches, local churches across the face of the earth, we need to discover once again about having one heart and one mind. The devil loves to bring disunity into a church and it can cause the most uh, terrible havoc in the life of a church. There was no disunity in this early church. They were together. And this isn't the first time that we read of their unity. We read about it in Acts 2 verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. One accord speaks of being one united together. And that was with the 120 that were in the upper room. And so, yeah, those 120 were in one accord. Now, if you go on to Acts 4, verse 32, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. So it could be easy to think, well, if there were 120 in the upper room, no problem. They could be in one accord, wild willy on the organ, everybody cutting loose. It can be great, you know what I mean? But now what happens when thousands begin to join the church? And that's answered in verse 32 of chapter 4. Because now even with the multitude, they were of one heart and one mind and one soul. They were focused. 
But it was focused beyond just a natural focus. It was a spiritual thing that God was doing. And I'd like to say to you, there was something extraordinary about their oneness. They were united around a common cause. What was that cause? It was the gospel of the kingdom. I want to ask you, do you have a cause that you are living for? For some of us, it's easy to answer that and we say, without a doubt, it's the kingdom of God. I'm living to see God's kingdom expanded. For others, you might not actually be able to answer that so clearly. And I've discovered that in this world that all, there are all sorts of crazy causes in the world. Do you know that there is a cause to save the unicorns? There is a cause to save the crop circles. There is a cause to save the aliens. I don't quite know how you do that and how you spend your time on that, but there are causes. You can go and Google them and read up and join the clubs and pay the membership fees for what I don't know, but people seem to want to live for a cause. Some of the radical bombings that we've seen around the world today are because people are being given a cause to live for. I don't believe it's at all the right cause, but there's something about a cause, and there was this cause here of the kingdom of God being established. But you know what? As God's people, we live for the ultimate cause, the kingdom of God. Can you get excited? It's the ultimate cause. There's nothing better on the planet that you can spend your time on but furthering and pursuing the kingdom of God. And that's why it says in Matthew 6, verse 10, when Jesus was telling his disciples to pray, after our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the worship and the honor, the first thing, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But to fulfill this cause... This wonderful kingdom cause, we need to be together. And God's plan is for us to be together, whereas the enemy's plan is to separate us and to isolate us. I want to tell you as a Christian, when, when you could potentially become offended or something, you could potentially become isolated, and that is so dangerous. The enemy's plan is to separate and isolate I quite enjoy watching some of these animal programs on TV, Animal Planet, National Geographic, etc. The predators and they're after the prey. And you might have this huge herd of wildebeest and you've got the lions and they are wanting to eat. They're hungry. And so what do they do? The strategy is always the same. They try to what? Isolate. They will try to stir up confusion and come from different sides. And if they can just get one of those wildebeest to run off from the herd of wildebeest, that wildebeest is in serious trouble, probably will not even survive it. The reason is because isolation is dangerous. Don't let the enemy isolate you. Stick with your spiritual family. This is what they were doing in the early church. One of the best ways to stay strong in faith is to stay together with other believers in Christ. Point number two, be sensitive to the needs of believers around you. Think about yourself for a moment. Are you a person that's sensitive to people's needs and you, you care, which is kind of an anticipating a need even before it manifests and you try to be a help and be a blessing? It says in verse 44 and verse 45, they had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now just look at that scripture for a moment and can I ask you, how many people here this morning, is this your absolutely favorite scripture verse in the whole <laughs> Bible. <laughs> I, see, I see somebody looking up at me with like disgust, you know. Uh, I would venture to say it's probably not your favorite one. It doesn't rank right up there about the God has plans for me to prosper me and give me hope and a future. 
But nonetheless, this is found in the context of the birth of the church and the power of God being manifest through this church. We can't just glance over it. Now, let me give a word of caution here. I want to say to you, don't sell anything unless God has clearly instructed you to do so. I have heard of people that did so, and knee-jerk reaction, they went out and sold everything, gave it to the poor, and it ended up with disastrous result, results. They ended up being on the street. And I believe essentially they overreacted, they overdid it, they got carried away. But I do believe we need to be sensitive to the needs of believers. And in verse 44, it's not on the screen, but it specifically says, all who believed. So whose needs were being met? It was all who believed. I want to submit to you, based on the context of this passage, that believers' needs were being met. Wow. Doesn't that just sound like we all look after each other? Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like. Believers' needs were being met. Now, I certainly believe in giving to non-believers and giving to the poor and helping in that way, but this verse specifically refers to the believers' needs being met. And I believe we should first be concerned about those that are believers, and then after that, those who are outside the household of faith. There's another scripture which says, do good to everyone especially those of the household of faith. I'd like to submit to you that sometimes the church has been so focused on giving outwardly to the poor that we've forgotten to look after each other sufficiently. Number three, the temple and house to house. It says in verse 46, so continuing with one accord in the temple, would you say the temple? And breaking bread from house to house. Please say house to house. Now you might say, well, how is it possible that they could still be meeting in the temple? Because the temple was the place for, let's call it the Orthodox Jews. And now many of these Jews had been converted. They'd become Messianic Jews. They'd become born again. How is it possible that they could still be meeting? Were they kind of hijacking the venue or what? Well, you know what? The power of the kingdom movement seemed to be so amazing that the Christians just flooded and almost took over the place. And that's where they began to meet and discuss the scriptures and so on. And so it's quite interesting that that is what was taking place. But ultimately, the church would need to begin to meet in their own environment because Christianity and Judaism were parting ways at this point in time. And so the church would begin to find their own places of meeting. So the early church met in two environments, both in the temple, that's the corporate celebration, and also house to house. And I'd like to ask you, isn't this maybe a kingdom pattern from God? Somebody could just read over this and they say, yeah, yeah temple, house to house, temple, house to house, what a... But I want to say to you, I believe that this is a kingdom pattern getting established. That we would come together for our big celebrations and they are awesome and we worship and we hear the word. But I want to tell you that life change happens in small groups. Point number five of six things I'm sharing with you. Favor with all people. I want to ask you, today in the world... Does the church of Jesus Christ have favor with all the people? I don't believe it does. And here it says in verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. This is quite remarkable. God was doing such a work that there was a fear that came upon the people and they knew that God is in the midst of those people. There's no fooling around. There's no messing around. They are serious about God. And I want to say I believe that God wants the church to experience favor with society. I believe that something has been lost in terms of that, and God wants the favor to be restored over His church. And I know you might say, but 
you know, light and dark are always going to be in a battle. Yes, darkness will always hate the light. But I believe that there can and still should be a regard and a respect for the children of light. Even though they might hate the church, there still needs to be almost like a, you don't mess with them because God is in their midst. There's a regard. There's a respect. Can I get an amen? amen? A few years ago, a book was released by the Barna Research Group called Unchristian. What the new generation really thinks about Christianity. And it argues that Christianity has been, become disliked by the world for a few basic reasons. These are the reasons. Christianity has become disliked by the world because of hypocrisy, saying one thing but doing another, having this morally superior attitude. Number two, too focused on getting converts. Outside people wonder if we really care about them. Or we're just trying to get more converts. Number three, the church has be, been, uh, become disliked because of being homophobic, which is essentially an irrational fear of homosexuals. We're quick to resent people and we're quick to write them off. Also, the church has become disliked because it is viewed, number four, as being sheltered. We're stuck in our own little world, out of touch with reality, boring, old-fashioned, and not willing to deal with the real dirt and grit and grime of people's lives. Number five, too busy with things that aren't our core business. The world perceives the church as too busy trying to talk about money all the time, trying to do fundraising, and uh, trying to get into politics, etc., and number six, the, ch the world perceives the church as judgmental and hypocritical. Isn't that sad? This is research that has been done. And I would say at least there is a fair amount of accuracy. But you know what? The world didn't perceive Jesus like that. And the world didn't perceive this early church like that because there was favor. There was favor, and I believe it became, came because of the work of God. And my question is, how can we help change the way people see Christianity? And I believe it's by doing this, by being, number one, authentic Christians, and number two, by being spirit-filled Christians, spirit-filled believers, just like the early church, and they experienced the favor of all people. I believe God wants to restore, restore something where there is a regard for the people of God because they know that something is there. God is in their midst. Point number six, which is a brief one. A kingdom-style church should be vibrant and growing. Would you agree with that? It should be vibrant. And it says in verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You see, the Christian community was growing with new um, conversations, with new um, conversions every day. This was happening all the time. They were growing. People were being added. And you know what? It hasn't stopped to this day. All around the world, there are tens of thousands of people continually converting to Christianity. They are giving their lives to God. And while you might not all see it right in one spot, I want to tell you the church is advancing. God says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I believe that a healthy church will attract people for Jesus. And if there's no people being attracted to Jesus, then you've got to say, well, something is wrong. And I want to say that we praise God for people that he has added to this local church. And yet still, I believe he wants to add many more people to this church. And I believe this will happen as you and I reflect a kingdom culture in a greater way. Won't you please say this after me? God is calling me to a kingdom culture. God is calling us to a kingdom lifestyle.
Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word to us and the encouragement that we see through the early church. We ask that this church and that the nation of South Africa, the churches in our nation and churches in our city would become more and more those that reflect the kingdom culture so that we can truly be like that early church and where they said that these are those that have turned the world upside down. And we thank you, Lord, that you do it not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. And we give you the thanks and the praise. In Jesus' name, would you say amen and give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.